um, if you don't want to be on by accident, make sure you keep yourself on, on mute. And we'll be recording on speaker view. Brilliant. Just letting a few more people in and then we'll cr get cracking once everybody's in. Okay, everybody, hello. This is the Footsteps Festival 21. 2021, which is a year-long festival celebrating living well with pain. The festival is a true co-production of people who live with pain, those who care for them, and healthcare professionals. We are very lucky to be supported by the Live Well With Pain website and the Physiotherapy Pain Association, both of whom have great resources and I highly recommend checking them out. Um, the details are actually in chat, so check them out. My name's Nikki Jones, your host for today. Um, I've lived experience of pain and of recovery through self-management. We're very privileged to have four experts in the field of pain and pain medication here with us today to talk about everything you wanted to know about painkillers that we're afraid to ask. Okay, this is a live question and answer session. We have had some questions pre-submitted, but I encourage you to put your questions in chat and we'll do our best to cover them. Um, but please remember, we're not able to give specific answers to your own medication issues. Questions will be anonymous because we're recording. Our experts will answer the questions from their own perspective and expertise. They have a wide range of that, as you will see. So today with us are Louise Trewern, who is the team leader of the Footsteps Festival, amongst a myriad of other advocacy roles, and is here as an expert by experience. Emma Davis, who is an advanced pharmacist, practitioner, pain management specialist, and co-founder of the Live Well With Pain website. Dr. Dee Burrows, who is a highly qualified pain specialist with a doctorate in strategies of pain self-management and has worked with pain management services in the NHS and privately for many years. And finally, last but very much not least, Dr. Deepak Rupindran, who is a consultant and clinical lead in pain medicine at the Royal Berkshire Hospital, best-selling author of The Pain-Free Mindset, and very interested in trauma-informed care. I'm going to pass you over to Louise, who will give a short introduction, and we'll go on to the others from there. Yeah, good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us. We, we were really keen to put this session on, as we've had lots of, of questions um, coming in to us. Um, but as Nikki said, we can't be specific. So we're going to try and, and, and perhaps make things a little clearer for people. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really struggling now. After all that, that um, difficult start, I'm, I'm struggling now to, to regain my ground. <laughs> um, so yeah, everybody I think knows, knows me by now. Um, I, I'm Vice Chair of British Pain Society, amongst other things. And yeah, this Footsteps Festival is our is our, um, our new project. Uh, all of us are really keen to try and help as many people as possible. Um, and that's why we recently sent out a survey to get your feedback on what, what things you'd find useful. Um, so yeah, so tonight, um, I don't know if the rest of the panel would like to introduce themselves as well. And that might be quite nice. I know Nikki's already done it nicely for us, but it'd be nice just to say hello. Deepak, would, deep would you like to yeah. go first? <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, Footstep Festival. Thank you, Louise and Nikki, for having me on today. And I'm really honored to be part of this group to be able to give some advice, support, and give my thoughts on the looking after what I'd been trained on, and I've realized that. It should never be the only thing that we have in our toolkit. So hopefully today I'll be able to help with the others in talking about how we should be more careful around medications in general. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Deepak. Dee, would you like to go next? Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Louise. And thank you, Footsteps. 
delighted to be here and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions um, and really focusing in on the rational use of, of pain medication as one toolkit in, in our various footsteps of strategies. So thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Emma, would you like to? Hi, everyone. Hi, Emma. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to take part in this. This is my first footsteps event. Um, I've had to take a bit of a back, uh, back seat recently for other reasons. So I'm really pleased to be here. Thanks for asking me. And I hope that we can um, give you some confidence around uh, the medicines that you use and perhaps choices that you have generally in terms of uh, living well with pain. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Maybe we could start off with a simple question. Um, and if we start off with Deepak, the question I want to ask is, what is the most effective pain medication? That wasn't really as simple as that, was it, Nikki? <laughs> um, we probably will have to ask what is the most effective thing you can do to manage your pain medications could be one of the choices there um, what our research into the existing evidence around how good and how effective pain medications are seems to indicate that only about 30 percent of the population will get really good benefit meaning that they'll get at least 50 percent relief so very unusual for someone to have their entire pain, pain being taken away by say that if that happens stick with it and that's really good but the reality is really that any drug can take about 30 to 50 percent of the pain down and that by that extent if we are going to go by that division then we should look at a drug that is capable of bringing your pain down by 30 to 50 percent but at the same time, not causing so many side effects that it makes other things difficult. So I would say on that category there, unfortunately or fortunately, the only drug that probably has been safe has been paralyzed. Beyond that, every other drug has had problems in some person or the other. And I've had my share of patients for whom even paracetamol can be a problem. So I, I would say that start with a medication that is safest to start with at the lowest dose and then consider adding in some kind of supported self-management strategies which is what the footsteps festival is all about but make it one step there i don't know if the others have anything to all you know want to add on to this please that's brilliant thank you d would you like to comment to that thank you very much and thank you deepak um so I would absolutely support what Deepak has said there. And I think what I'd like to add is that there's a difference between what the evidence shows, you know, this particular pain medication um, in all the research helps 50% of the people 50% of the time with 50% reduction compared to our own personal experience of what is the most effective for us. And I guess um, when I'm thinking about pain medication, I'm thinking about what, what does the person want from it? Is it about less pain? Is it about improved mood? Is it about improved sleep? Is it about being able to do more? How is the medication helping the individual to move towards what they want to be able to do? because that is the best medication, so long as you get that balance between effect here and side effect somewhat lower. Thank you, Nikki. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Dee. Emma, would you like to? Yeah, um, yes, I concur with my two colleagues there. Um, I, I, as soon as the question was asked, I thought the answer is, is the best medicine is the one which works for you. Um, I think the problem with all medicines as time goes on is we, we learn a lot more about medicines over time. 
Um, and so even paracetamol now, there is a building evidence base to um, which sort of implies that it is actually poorly effective in a lot of long-term pain conditions that we have traditionally used it in. I think to be pragmatic and as, as both Deepak and Dee have said, what, what is becoming increasingly important, I think, is that you <clears throat> have the opportunity to try a medicine, but that it has to be couched within the idea of <clears throat> those outcomes, which are primarily function, which is what you're able to do, more so than just pure pain reduction. So in some ways, there's no point being pain-free if you're not able to do anything. And we could make some people pain-free by just giving them huge quantities of medicines to the point that they either didn't really care anymore because they had so much stuff on board or, or that they had reached a ceiling level where not, you know, they just couldn't feel anything. And that might be emotional feelings as well as physical feelings. But if you're not then able to do something with that, if you're not able to get out and live the life that you want to live and interact with the people you want to and you know do the activity that you want to do there's there's very little point to that so that's where this balance comes in so for some people even paracetamol tips that balance too far in that direction and then for other people they will require a mixture of medicines but that balance is always a very fine one i think um, and what we're finding is for more and more people as they learn those other management techniques, medicines drop down the list of priorities within their toolbox um, because that balance can be so difficult to reach. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Louise, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, thanks. I think that's a really important thing and it, the medicine that works for you. But I think an interesting thing for me was that I didn't recognise that actually the medication was starting to take over and, the, and my quality of life had gone right down. So the scales had completely shifted for me. Um, and I just assumed that my condition must be getting worse. Um, and I wrongly believed that. Um, so I think it's, if you if you were feeling the same, wondering if actually your condition's getting worse, perhaps just go and get that checked out with your prescriber. Um, because I, I certainly didn't recognize it. And, you know, I think that is a really important point. We all want to be pain free, but I think actually now looking with hindsight, that's quite an unrealistic expectation to be totally pain free. Unless as Emma said, you're so drugged up that you just don't care what's going on. And I appreciate that sometimes we're in such a lot of pain that that idea seems actually quite blissful to think about. But it's not really, is it? Because then we can't we can't function, we can't live our lives effectively. I'm off the drugs now. I still live with pain, but my quality of life is so much better. So, you know, it's about balance. Nobody's saying don't take any painkillers, but and that painkiller, because there isn't one. That's the whole point. Um, but it's about finding the right balance. So yeah, it's a tricky one, I know, but it it it's um I think it's really important because of the whole thing of, of whether you realise there's a problem. That's it, exactly. It's, it's very difficult. So if somebody's watching this and wondering about their drugs, who, who's the best person to go to to have a medication with you? Who did you go to, Louise? Hmm. Well, that's a, again, that's a, a, a tricky one. I mean, it, D was the person that <laughs> pointed all this out to me when I was referred to pain clinic. Um, so if you're if you're able to speak to to um, a, a specialist at the pain clinic, that's ideal. If you're not, my second suggestion would be the the pharmacist because they understand the drugs the best. Um, so yeah, it, it depends who you've got the the quickest access to. I would think. Um, I don't know if if uh, the, the rest of the panel has a has a different view. Yeah, Deepak. I I would probably say that these days there is so much awareness and there is so much uh, investment. Let's say of good, very well qualified pharmacists embedded within a lot of GP 
uh, surgeries. In fact, in my area in Baksha, where I am, almost every practice or at least a group of two or three practices have got, has got a fully qualified pharmacist embedded within there. And one of their uh, primary responsibilities is to help the GP look after patients who are on pain medication, who are there to look at people who are on combinations of medications and making sure that there isn't uh, any chance of harm happening and just to review and make sure that things are just a little bit enthusiastic, but I think to find a balance and at least that resource is there. So I for listening here, if their mind approaching the GP is probably far quicker than trying to wait right now for a pain clinic consultation or a referral. Steve, would you like to? Uh, yes, I agree. I think if it's a very quick query, a good port of call, an immediate um, solution is actually the dispensing pharmacist. So at the chemist where you pick up your prescriptions. Um, after that, I would suggest the practice pharmacist and most practice pharmacists have really good contacts with the GPs with whom they work, the community matrons, the practice nurses and with those of us who work in secondary care. I, I don't think a day goes by where I don't have a phone call or an email um, discussion with one of the practice pharmacists. Sometimes it's me that institutes that um, and sometimes it's them and they are really fantastic colleagues where we can really work together. The person who's on the medication, the practice pharmacist and myself. So um, I would very much recommend that. Brilliant, thanks. And let's go to the pharmacist, Emma. <laughs> well, that was nice. Uh, <laughs> um, what I, what I would say, I mean, the benefit of pharmacists in, in practice at the moment is that currently most of them tend to have longer appointment times. And I think that is quite an important point when you have concerns around medicines, which are quite complex and where there's quite a lot of other things going on, which may be affecting your response and how you're managing um, your health generally. Um, so that is an advantage. Um, <clears throat> Community pharmacists are a really good port of call, as, as Dee has said, in, in part because you don't need an appointment, which is the barrier to, to every other option available, really, I think, isn't it? Um, but they may feel a little bit limited. They're, they're, they have varying amounts of information that they're able to access from community pharmacy. So, but um, what they will possibly be able to do is, is get in contact with your surgery and at least let them know that you you have concerns and they can sometimes act as a really useful go between as well. Um, so in, in some ways you need to go to someone that you trust and that you have a good relationship with and that you feel able to have that conversation with. A lot of the time problems with medicines um, go ignored by, by everybody involved. Um, a lot of the problems um, with pain medicines creep on over time as well and it can be very easily dismissed as just another problem that you've developed or um, often not sort of thought immediately to be a problem with the pain medicines particularly it might be something else um, so I think the most important thing is that your conversation is with somebody that you feel um, is going to listen to you and that you feel confident with what they are going to say back to you as well. That's very important. And it, that's actually another question that's come in, which speaks to this. So I'll, I'll keep you here. And um, this question is, do you have any tips for pushing back about medication your doctor thinks you should take, but you are not sure you should take it? All too often, the doctor is already tapping out prescription details without discussing whether the medication will be for the long term alternative approaches to pain management, etc. Seems to be quite a lot of people's experience. What, what's your I do on this. I missed the last part there, Nikki. Could you just repeat that question again? Uh, the, the question was, do you have any tips for pushing back about medication your doctor thinks you should take, but you are not sure that you should take it? 
So all too often the doctor is already writing a prescription without discussing it fully. And how, how, how do you sort of approach your doctor to not give you a prescription and to look at different things? So, um, do are the other, one of the others want to take this first? Yeah, oh, Emma. Oh, yeah, I'll step in. Um, I think uh, certainly something that I do when I am talking to people about potentially trialing a medicine is I make it very clear that that decision doesn't need to be made today. I think um, you need to have time to go away, think about the process, think about whether that is something that you do want to do. Um, talk to other people around you because um, we know that living with pain doesn't affect just the person with the pain, but um, all of those people around them who are supporting them as well. Um, and it's important that your support network understands, you know, decisions that you're making and how, how that might impact on you and them, what additional support you might need. Um, so I, I think it is quite important if you are not 100% sure that that prescription is what you want, that you should feel confident to say, I don't want to take the prescription today. You can take a prescription and not get it dispensed. So for most prescriptions, even if it's for a controlled drug, like a gabapentinoid, so pregabalin, a gabapentin, um, or an opioid medicine, you, you have up to 28 days to actually get that prescription dispensed on a community prescription. So if you weren't sure whether that was something you wanted, you could, if you felt you had no option but to physically take the prescription, that doesn't mean you have to get it dispensed and it doesn't mean you have to take it. But I think it's, it is really important if you are uncertain to feel confident to say that to the prescriber. And, and let them know, actually, I don't want it today. Can I go away and think about it? Um, and can I come back and have another chat with you? And I shouldn't imagine there are many prescribers who would actually be frustrated or disappointed by that. Um, there is a, there's been quite a lot of research into this, uh, the interaction and, and the handing over of a prescription. And there is, quite a lot of evidence that suggests that patients think that the GP wants to give them a prescription and the GP thinks the patient wants a prescription and nobody ever actually has a conversation about what, what the truth of the matter is. So be confident and say, I don't know that that's exactly what I want. And also, what are my other options? That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Emma. Louise, do you have anything to yeah, I think we've all, most of us anyway, grown up in an age where you just assume that that um, the doctor's word goes and, and that's it. And, and I think, you know, doctors have as well, obviously. And I think actually, you know, what I've been saying is right, we need to have that conversation. And just because it's the doctor has made a suggestion doesn't mean that he's saying that is the only thing that you can do. Um, it's just a suggestion. So you are you are able to question that and and you know you're not going to be thought of badly because you've questioned the doctor. If you have questions, you need to air them. Um, and I'm just as guilty of this. I, I would just go to the doctor with my problem, listen to the, the advice he gave, assume that a drug might be the only answer, and just go with it. And and actually, you know, we're, I think even um GPs want to change that now. Let's let's question it and make sure we fully understand what it is that we're we're talking about. If it is a medication, if if um, you know we're we're free to ask if there are other other ways that we could deal with this other than medication. Now you don't have to just accept what what you're told. And if you have got the slightest um, doubt that maybe this medication isn't right for you, then simply don't accept that. Uh, uh, but I would urge you to have the conversation um, because, you know, our, our doctors aren't aren't mind readers. Um, and so we need to we need to point out what our worries are. Brilliant. Conversation has changed, Nick. Go deep back. Fourth. Probably been uh, even 
I think when I qualified as a consultant as well, I would have probably just said, you know what, okay, I think you've got a nervous system that's sensitive or you, you would benefit from a medication there. I'm going to give you this drug, take this for two months, and I'd be telling them to contact their GP. I think because of how we've now become much more aware of the problems around opioids, we've become much more aware about the issues around drugs like gabapentin or presence. Now in the pain clinic, most of my colleagues, we at least say, you know what, these are the options. What do you think you want to do? And a lot of my GP colleagues as well, now in the last two, three years that we've been talking to them, they're also more mindful when it comes to pain medication. So I think the opportunities are there exactly as Emma said, that if a patient now goes to their, I'm concerned because I've heard about the issues, I think a GP will not be that keen to just say, take it and that's it, you know, what else? Aware of the resources like Live Well With Pain or Footsteps or what are the options there, or maybe in that area, there isn't just the resources available as alternative, but that's a separate discussion and that would, that all these resourcing has to be put in place. And definitely think the atmosphere is very much changed from what it was four or five years ago. Yes, definitely. Dee, would you like to add anything? Thank you. I, I think the issue about confidence is a really important one because I think when we go to the doctors, we can feel a little bit overwhelmed. We can be mindful of the pressures of time for them and maybe for ourselves. And we tend to zoop through the consultation as quickly as possible to get out as quickly as possible without necessarily having met our needs. And that could be our needs as a patient or our needs as a as a GP or a prescriber. So I think it is about having that conversation. And I think, you know, in ordinary day to day language, we might ask each other, well, what are the pros and cons of that? Well, your GP does understand those words. So just if they're going to prescribe, well, what are the pros and cons of this medication? OK, well, let me go and speak to my family about that. Or, or perhaps I could go away and have a think about it and then have an appointment with a practice pharmacist. Um, are there any other options? Um, I want to think about my, what I want to achieve if I go on this medication, what my goals are, what I want to achieve. Um, I've heard something about social prescribing. What's that when it's at home? So I think it's just about not trying to sort of second guess the language that you would use just because you're in front of a GP or a, or a different prescriber, but the language you use on a day-to-day -day basis. What makes sense to you? Because if it makes sense to you, that's the question to ask your GP. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much. Nikki, can I just say something else? Because I, I think the other thing, to be um, aware of as well is if, if you are offered a prescription, um, it is also worth asking what happens if this doesn't help me. So if you've had the conversation with your prescriber, what, are, what am I hoping to get from this? And now we would say that with any medicine, regardless of the class, what we're looking to see is, is that it enables somebody to function better, to be able to do more. Um, we assume that if somebody is doing more, that their pain interference, so how much pain is getting in the way of that function is reduced. And consequently, we, it's very likely that the pain that you feel is less. But if that isn't achieved, what, what happens then? How do you then take that medicine away? Because what we understand much better now than even say five years ago, is that staying on a medicine which isn't helping is only likely to be harming. And so I think it's important to feel com comfortable in trying something, but you need to be very clear, and so does the prescriber, what, what is the, a good outcome from this trial? And then if we don't achieve that in a 
specified time, what, how do we get off this medicine? Yeah, I, I'd agree completely. We need, an, we need an exit strategy, don't you? Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion lately about opioids and the issues we uh, have now discovered there are with, and Louise has had her experience of it. Um, just wonder if we could just sort of um, investigate that a little bit, because there are a lot of people who are left, you know, who are still on high dose opioids at the moment, and they might be wondering, you know, what, what they're supposed to do, what are they going, going to say to their prescribers, you know, how do they get off these drugs, do they get off these drugs? So maybe we could have a little bit of a sort of talk about that, maybe we start with Deepak. You're on mute. Uh, Francis Thomas. <laughs> Out the same thing on opioids, really. Um, was the question more on uh, the opioids and reduction of opioids, isn't it, or the problem around opioids itself? Oh, speak speak to any of those things that you'd like to. <laughs> Big topic, I know, but um... I. I I think the tapering part, I'll step a second there and probably Emma or Dee will, will have more experience with Louise on there. But I think the opioids, the biggest issue that we've discovered is that the long-term effects of significant. Um, initially, it started out, I remember 10 years ago, when I first came to be aware of it, I thought this was only seen in people who were opioid addicts and those were the ones that were you know, the ones who were using, misusing street uh, opioids and all of that were the problem. But we've realized that in the last five to 10 years from what's happened on the other side of the pond is that it is quite a problem with even prescription opioids. And in fact, the problem is that when prescription opioids are given in higher and higher doses, people get stuck and then it gets continued in the community and then it keeps increasing with nobody looking after it. That is a big problem. And that problem means that people's uh, in the body, the reward pathway gets used to it and starts to want it more and more. So the dosage starts to go up. And I think that is something we've realized is not useful because as Dee and Emma have pointed out, what we want actually from any kind of painkillers or pain medication, we want to give medication function and that just wasn't happening uh, with the opioids that were. So we've realized that the problem is how do you now, first of all, look at people who are on a high dose and, and I talk about, and in my practice clinically, I now regularly have something called as an opioid risk tool. So that's just a simple set of questions. I ask anyone if I'm going to start opioids and in the last two, three years, even those who come to me, I ask the score is, is just about seven questions done in the clinic. And if that comes out as on the higher side, I then tend to start raising the conversation and say, is it improving your function? Do you think you're in a place wherein you might want to consider an alternative or consider reducing? And that's a conversation that I just gently start. It's not to reduce it, but it is to just raise awareness that if it is not doing what it's supposed to do, if it's not saying what it's on the tin, then should we come? That is part of the conversation. I think the tapering, I'll come on to it another time, or maybe MRD can take this up on that. Okay. Um, Louise, would you like to go next about this? I've lost what I was going to say now. <laughs> Perhaps one of the others would like to go before me. <laughs> okay, D, you go then. <laughs> Thank you. So also thrown a bit into the deep end because I was just answering somebody's question on chat. So I did listen to you, Deepak, but with half an ear, I'm afraid, rather than both ears. Um, so I think part of the question was about opioid reduction. Yes. Is that correct, Nikki? Yeah. So. Um, so what we would 
generally do is that there, there are published guidelines on reducing opioids and reducing other medications and how safe it is for the speed and so on and so forth. But the, I guess the area that I'm particularly interested in, as well as what we might call de-prescribing, not because my name is D, but reducing rather than increasing medication, um, is that it's, it's not a just about the medication. Again, it's about you. It's the goals that you're moving towards. It's how, um, excuse the jargon here, but how threat activated you become by the idea of reducing your medication. So if I'm working with somebody on reducing medication, I get them to have a look at a, um, our own NHS website down in Devon. Um, I get them to have a look at some videos that we've put together. We send out some information sheets that we've put together that Louise helped us with. Um, I ask them to have a look at the my.livewellwithpain.co.uk website, perhaps explore the festival to get a, a feel for the other things that are out there. Because however keen we are to step down and come off a medication, if this idea has come from us personally, those tricky threat systems in the brain that are do with our fight, flight, freeze and flop will suddenly go ping. Why are you trying to get me off this medication when I've got pain? And you go into one of those sorts of zones. And so we need to have strategies to soothe down that threat so that the part of us that has made the decision that we want to work with our practitioners to step down the medication is able to do so. Otherwise, we're having a battle with ourselves. And I'm sure many of you will have experienced that. And sometimes people say to me, they've got stuck. They've got stuck with the step down. So yes, of course, I want to know what they mean by that. But actually, most of all, I want to understand what's going on in their lives so we can see if we can identify the stuckness. So recently, a lady said to me, I've really got stuck in my step down. And I asked her what was going on in her life. And in six weeks time, her daughter is getting married. So the last thing she wants to do is risk suddenly having an increase in her pain. And that's that threat activation. So what we agreed was we park and pause till after the wedding. She'll stay on her current dose until after the wedding and then we'll get going again. So I, th I think, again, it's that that gentle way of doing it. Now, this is easy for me to say. I'm an expert in pain management. Um, I have expertise in various psychotherapeutic approaches. Um, and although many GPs and practice pharmacists have good skills in that direction, they don't have the depth of skill I do in pain management, just like I don't have the breadth of skill that they have across healthcare. So, so there's also something about being aware of this threat and the personal lives that you have. And as Nikki was saying earlier, the, the family has to help you move forward with the goal of, of stepping down and parking and pausing when you need to. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, um, Dee. Um, Emma, would you like to speak to some of the sort of harms of opioids because they've become sort of increasingly obvious recently? And I'm not sure that people really understand them. I, I know I didn't. I was being told to reduce them, but I didn't have any real understanding as to why. I think it might help people to ha have a bit of understanding of that. Hello. 
uh, answering chat as well, right. Um, okay, so yeah, I think um, the long-term harms is, is something that um, we're increasingly aware of. And I, I think um, as Deepak referenced, for quite a long time, I think most people's concerns around the use of opioids was in relation to addiction. And I think we now understand a lot more uh, in terms of that actually being a relatively small number of people, a much larger number of people developing dependence, which um, Deepak um, explained. Um, but also a lot of people will um, unwittingly develop other harms. Uh, so we might refer to those as adverse effects. So <clears throat> you might think of things like constipation, nausea, sedation. Um, and those are side effects of um, opioids and gabapentinoids, actually, that I think we're all sort of probably reasonably familiar with. They tend to be at the top of the list of side effects when you read the patient information leaflet. So if you start reading and think, well, that's depressing, I'm not reading any further, you'll probably have picked those up. Um, what we understand a lot better now is some of the other longer term harms that are associated not just with any particular opioid and not necessarily with high doses either, but with uh, longevity. So the longer that you are taking the medicine for, the more likely it is you will develop some of these problems. Of course, if you're then also taking high doses for a long period of time, your risk escalates pretty rapidly. So some of those side effects include things like depression and anxiety, so there is uh, good evidence that people who perhaps have a history of depression um, may have a re-emergence of depression if they have felt that it's been well managed and then they are maintained on opioids for a long time. Um, but people can also develop depression. Now that's a really tricky one because of course living with pain is very tightly linked to uh, depression and anxiety, understandably. And so that's one of those side effects that may be a side effect, but may be a consequence of living with pain. We also know that people with depression and anxiety are more likely to develop pain. So that is one of those ones that becomes very difficult to tease apart and is perhaps why often it's missed as potentially the opioid being part of the problem. Not necessarily the whole problem, but certainly part of it. We then have other things. So we know that opioids can also cause changes in endocrine function. So that's sort of like your inbuilt steroid system, uh, thyroid function, sex hormones. So we know that there are changes in sexual function, fertility. That's something that we're worried about because we know that more younger people are starting on these medicines earlier on. Um, but also just sexual function, so that can affect relationships and, you know, that's a, a really big problem um, when you're, um, you know, trying to live with pain and then you also have those additional problems. Um, but also sex hormone changes have other effects in terms of functioning. Um, you probably pick it up more easily in men, and but again, this is something that gets missed and I remember having a conversation with a urologist who ran an erectile dysfunction clinic and asked him how many of the men coming through that clinic um, were on opioids and he said why <laughs> and he didn't know that there was that connection but what he then did was go and have a look and said oh my goodness quite a lot actually um, so um, and that is sort of the problem that a lot of these side effects are quite insidious so they creep on over time they are conditions that you may develop anyway and opioids may just make the likelihood of you developing that more um, or they may make that problem worse but it can be very difficult to pick it up i'll just list some others quickly so um osteoporosis so that's like bone thinning and of course that can um, be a problem if you fall. And we also know that long-term opioids are associated with high rates of falls. And that becomes more of a problem as you get older. Or if you've got something going on that makes you um, 
unsteady or not very confident moving around, then obviously anything that may make that worse is a problem. Um, I've said depression, anxiety, um, long-term constipation is a very often a problem which people don't like to talk about, but which can have significant um, detrimental effect again on your function, but also on your pain levels um, and just your sort of general life, you know, day-to-day -day life. Um, opioids initially can help with sleep, but we know that over time, actually they can start interfering with sleep. So um, particularly as doses increase, um, some people experience hallucinations, but other people just experience disturbed sleep patterns. And again, that has a real knock on effect because we know that when you're tired, your emotional state tends to rise and it becomes much harder to uh, manage pain under those circumstances as well and your pain perception. So the amount of pain you physically feel also increases. Um, I won't go on and on because it, it gets a bit depressing. We have some information on the Live Well With Pain website. We have um, a thing called the Opioid Lottery um, and that lists most of the main long-term effects. Um, so if you want to check that out, we do find that people find that quite helpful. As I said, part of the problem is it's very difficult to spot how opioids may be contributing to some of these other problems. And that checklist can be quite helpful just in terms of saying, well, I don't know for sure it's the opioid, but maybe it is. And then it's a good way of starting a conversation about, could this be the opioid? And if so, what do I do about it? Yeah, absolutely. And I put the link for Live Well With Pain in the chat so people can check that out there. Um, it's certainly, the opioids have certainly souped up my menopause. <laughs> I think so. Louise, I know you've had some um, fun effects from opioids with you. Yeah, and I think that's another point that Emma raised there is that some of these things can, can creep on so slowly you don't even notice them. Um, and, you know, I think for me, that's exactly what happened. I thought, because I, I have fibromyalgia, that sort of encompasses lots of weird things anyway. So whenever a new weird thing would crop up, I just attributed it to the fibromyalgia. Oh, well, that's that's that. And that's getting worse. And, you know, gradually over a period of time, I had more and more skin infections, more and more, um, <clears throat> excuse me, chest infections and colds would last longer than everybody else. And just all sorts of little things that crept up over time. And eventually those would take me to the doctor and they would get medicated um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I ended up on a complete cocktail of drugs treating all these different things that it's only, you know, after I came off them that all these things started to fall away. So it was even more evident that it was due to the long-term use of, of opioids. Now, you know, I didn't realize this until afterwards. <laughs> so, um, and, and I'm not sure um, how easy it is to, for the GPs to notice this. I think they're becoming better at recognising these things, but I certainly didn't know. I assumed it was all my condition. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing as well, coming back to this business with fear, I think that is probably one of all of our biggest issues is fear of coming off these drugs because we know that they're strong drugs um, or even reducing not necessarily stopping um, and so surely our pain's going to be worse um, and I think maybe it is for a short time but that that adjusts in most of us and again I'd say well how do we know um, unless we try um, and again I think it also comes back to weighing up your quality of life now um, if you're if you're in doubt, what's your quality of life like right now on on these drugs? Uh, if you are on on some medication that you're in doubt about, um, if that's not very good, mine was awful, and I I still say right now that I think meeting D saved my life because if if I hadn't realised the the path I was on, I don't think I'd be here today. I was getting worse and worse as time went on. And I lived my life in the armchair. Um, and most of it, I was, I would have argued with you that, that the drugs didn't affect me, 
but they darn well did. And I didn't see it until afterwards. I would fall asleep during conversations with people. You know, I would have a FaceTime call with my grandchildren and just doze off. Um, you know, and now I look back and I think that's awful. Um, but it happened all the time. And in the end, people stopped inviting me to things because I would always say no, because I couldn't plan. You know, my life was just really awful when I look back. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing is that a lot of these things creep on and you don't even know. So if you are taking medications that you're not sure about, get some advice and find out. Um, you know, just ask the questions. Definitely, that's that's the right thing to do. Um, there have been quite a few questions about um, amitriptyline as a as a pain. Um, I don't want to say killer because it doesn't, but um, people are using amitri amitriptyline. Um, somebody asked. Um, so my impression is that people take this medication long term to manage pain. However, I came across information that says generally the lowest effective dose should be used for the shortest duration required to, to um, treat the symptoms under the heading neuropathic pain. It was on some uh, somewhere on the internet on medicines.org. Um, is are the tricyclics a problem long term or are they an effective way of, of treating pains or are there sort of are people finding issues with those? Maybe go to Emma first. Right. Um I think I think it's a standard answer that it may it may be helpful for somebody long long in the longer term. The idea that you use the smallest effective dose for the shortest possible time, I would say stands with pretty much treating any condition um, because ideally we would like people to be on as few medicines as possible. Um, how realistic that is for some people is, is, a, is a different matter. But I think um, certainly if you are starting a medicine, um, it is sensible to have that reviewed um, on a regular basis and because even if if you sort of feel initially it is of some benefit that it's enabling you to do more that it may be reducing the amount of pain that you are experiencing there is no guarantee that that will continue over time um, so what may be an effective dose now you may feel over time becomes less effective you may try a couple of dose increases within a safe limit but then you may get to a point where you feel it just isn't helping you anymore. So part of the reason to say that shortest effective dose for the shortest possible time is partly to in ensure that there is that regular review process and that we only continue medicines which are genuinely helping somebody to do more and to live better. Um, for some people that could be several years and, and so that is why you know, it's really important that you feed that back to whoever is prescribing. So if, if you are called in for a review or if you request a review, um, people often know, even if they're on several medicines, they often have a good idea which one they think is the one that helps them. Um, and certainly there is no, I don't think there's much great um, incentive on the part of a prescriber to take away a medicine which is helping somebody to do more and live better. That's what we'd like <laughs> overall. So if we feel that a medicine is helping, we're not going to rush to take it away. What we're concerned about is people who feel that they have to continue medicines because they don't feel they have any alternatives or people who just get stuck continuing to take medicines in spite of them not helping or possibly harming. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, Dee, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. Um, I think there's a few sort of strands that I would just really quite like to, to comment on briefly. This bottle of water has an effect and a side effect. The effect is that if I keep drinking it, A, I'll keep hydrated, and B, I'll, I won't stumble over my words because of a dry mouth. 
but the side effect is that at some point I will need to go to use the bathroom. And luckily, um, I have a, a bathroom not too far away. So the side effect is manageable. Um, but if the bathroom was a very long way away, it might be considerably less manageable. So all medications have effects and side effects, and that includes all the different medications that we take for pain. And coming back to amitriptyline, we tend to think of amitriptyline along with the other drugs that are taken for nerve pain as being a drug that needs to be taken on a daily basis. I have people who use amitriptyline for several days when they have a flare up and are otherwise not on it. It works for them. I have people whose pain is worse in the winter months. So at this time of year, they're stepping off their medication. In the summer, they're off it. In the autumn, they step back on low doses. In the winter, they're at the highest dose for them. And then in the spring, they're stepping back off it again. And that works for them. And it means that they're on the lowest dose for the shortest period of time. And it helps to maintain that effectiveness. So we, we know that we tend to become quickly tolerant to opioids. We believe that that tolerance takes longer with things like amitriptyline, but we also believe it happens. And we also know that our individual genetics plays a part in that. And at the moment, we don't do a blood test on you when you come to us wanting a medication or a change in medication so that we know your genetic picture. That may come in the future, but it's not something that we do at the moment. So it is about being as informed as you possibly can be about your own medication, linking it with what it is you want from the medication, which is where we started the session, using the medication rationally. So if you have a goal that you want to achieve, maybe you need a bit of medication to help you towards that. If you have an event, if you have a flare up, perhaps you're taking medication that you don't normally take or you're taking a little bit more, but it's checking in, you know, every month or two, checking in, is my medication still doing what I want and need it to do? Am I still able to do as much as I want to be able to do and that my condition allows me to do? And what can I learn from this huge basket of strategies that are out there that the festival is the footsteps festival is just um illuminating our lives with that we can use either instead of or alongside medication thank you nikki thank you and you're saying medication is a tool along with all this other stuff deepak have you got anything you want to say on this Yeah, I probably what I would say is I think Emma and Dee have almost covered everything that I would have wanted to talk about it. And I think the thoughts about amitriptyline coming from a very medical or doctor angle, depending on whoever's listening today, if you go to your GPs or your specialists, right now uh, in all the NICE guidelines or any guidelines that are there, this drug like amitriptyline is going to feature on it's been suggested as a line drug to be given. And uh, sometimes I get still a lot of patients worried about the fact that why are they being given a antidepressant drug for pain itself. And uh, our understanding is now that really the problem is that in some people when the pain is more persistent, along with what might have started out as an initial focus of injury, maybe in their knee or in their back or anywhere, the nervous system gets involved in 
signals gets more amplified. People describe the, the dial or the radio dial of the volume button just goes up and up. And amitriptyline works to dampen that volume, bring down that volume dial from an eight or a nine to maybe a three or a four or a five. So that's what it is capable of doing in some people. And we doctors tend to look at that as saying, okay, that's a safe first starter. The guidelines are suggesting it, so we'll recommend it. But whatever we spoke this evening all stands. Your perfect rights to get, um, get as much understanding from the doctor as to why they want to do it for the shortest possible time for on the lowest possible dose. And if you know from Footsteps like Fair, Footstep Festival or other websites or what are the other options, then trying a small dose of amitriptyline for a period of time to help improve function isn't a bad idea. And you may say, well, what else do I need to know in order to take this drug safely? And that's something doctors will be able to discuss would be able to do you if you were to go down that route. Um, I think what Dee mentioned about knowledge is very important and I'd like to say that now there can really be no excuse for not being made aware of that. There are so many good websites from you know from Royal College websites to now public facing websites like Live Well with Pain which give that necessary information and part of what I try to do in my book as well is to achieve that same thing. Just make patients just more aware of what your choices are. Then you can decide if you or not. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Louise, was there anything you wanted to add, add to this or are you? No, I just just really to agree with all that. I think it's, it's about um, choice isn't it I, I also want to add that you know I think a lot has been made recently about um the, the, the people having sorry start again people being made to feel awful because they are taking drugs and I don't think they should either I think what what we're trying to advocate for is just safer prescribing and more reviews of drugs so you know if you've been on something for an awfully long time and it hasn't been checked out go and ask for it to be checked out just make sure that what you're taking is is working for you as has already been said um you know there's at safe levels if that's something you need then there's nothing wrong with that what what we're more concerned about i think is when when people have been taking something for so long that you don't know whether it's working anymore and chances are it, it probably isn't and it could even be making you worse so by getting it reviewed and possibly coming down or off it altogether it might improve your life so it's just about being informed and 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 finding out where you're at with your your current regime thank you Louise. we've had quite a few can questions so can i i was just yes, going to go rudely interrupt um, i'm just on there louise's point there um it is um, often said to be the best practice to intermittently review medicines and try reducing them down, even if you don't think they are doing you harm. Um, if you think actually I'm functioning really well, that may still be a reason to try just very slowly reducing the dose to see if you can maintain function on less. So it's not about always stopping medicines and saying everything needs to stop, but to see if you can um, maintain that improvement that you've seen on a slightly lower dose, because with any medicine, as we've already said, the less that you need to take, the better. So if you can keep doing more with less, um, then that is something to consider as well. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a lot of people have, um, ask questions about when you are tapering how how do you stop or avoid withdrawal effects that's not just with opioids that's with gabapentinoids and ssris and tricyclics as well i mean do you what would you be advising somebody especially if they're very frightened at the idea if they've had some quite aversive experiences with withdrawal we can go for d first maybe or or emma whoever wants to go first I think it's about knowing what the withdrawal effects might be. 
um, again, so that they don't come up and bite you and increase your, your threat, your fears. Some people manage to reduce without any withdrawal effects whatsoever. And that is the case, it seems to me, however fast or slow they do it. In order to reduce the impact of withdrawal effects, we usually take it quite slowly. So reducing the dose by the agreed amount um, every two to four weeks might be one pattern. With that park and pause that I mentioned, if needed, in between. In a way, the, an the, the answer to this question actually gets to the precise drug and the precise dose that the individual is on. So it's sort of a difficult question to answer as an in principle. But if, for example, let's say you were on paracetamol and you were taking two tablets four times a day, you would initially go to seven tablets a day, a couple of weeks later to six tablets a day, and so on from there. When you're on, um, for example, an opioid, you might reduce by 10 milligrams every couple of weeks. But the, the reduction is as much a prescription as the increase is a prescription. So staying within the, working with your de-prescriber is as important as working with your prescriber. Brilliant. Thanks, Steve. Emma, would you like to? Yeah, I think what, what Dee said is, uh, is important. So um, th there are no sort of hard and fast rules. There are probably things which we wouldn't advise, which would be to just suddenly stop. So go from whatever you're taking to nothing at all. Um, I have supported people who've done that and it's um, some people have actually done that and they've been fine and other people have had an absolutely torrid time. Um, so we would tend to, to advise against doing that and to take a little bit of time and just to carefully reduce. Um, the amount that you reduce will be very dependent, as Dee said, on, on the medicine itself. There's a degree to which we're slightly stuck because different formulations come in different strengths. So um, with patches, for example, there I say, Nikki, they're, they're an absolute nightmare because they're very fixed in terms of the dosing. Um, and there may sometimes be a necessity to change from what you're currently taking to an alternative that allows you to make much smaller reductions. But that will, that needs to be guided by you as well as by the um, prescriber because um, as we've alluded to, the confidence in that process needs to be on both sides. And um, as a prescriber, I can assure you that it is very nerve wracking to make reductions just as it must be for the person who is having that reduction made to their medicine. So having very open and honest discussions about how this might go, how it is going is, is really important. So some people might be happy to just have a fixed amount taken away all the, the time. And other people may want to go very slowly to start with. They may speed up in the middle. And then towards the end, if you're trying to come off altogether, that can actually be the most difficult point. Um, so lengthening times between changes, taking away the smallest amount that you can feasibly do, that can be a help, um, but it needs to be a conversation between all the parties involved, I think. Um, and this is the difficulty. We can have guidelines and we can say, this is a suggested way of reducing. And that might work for 10 people, but the next 10 people that come through the door, it won't work at all. So we need to be flexible and be able to adapt what we're doing to the person sitting with us in the room and that person has got to give the feedback to the prescriber as well. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Deepak, have you got anything to say about this? Or... Uh, not really. My only step of suggestion would be that the and Emma very 
we should be going through the process of reduction there. I think the only thing I would add in is to actually say that, first of all, are the patients completely sure that they want to reduce? Uh, is that a decision that they have made or they feel that it has been forced upon them or been suggested there? And that is something that patients get equally worried about when, when being suggested that it's the same threat response that comes up there is if they've been told something that they're not. Yes, systems must be in, have still ambivalent about discussing about there. Then the first step that GPs or pharmacists or even what I'm saying my team should be doing in the clinic is to first have that first chat with the patient to actually say, well, what do you want to reduce it for? What are your beliefs? What are your concerns? What have you heard about? And are you ready to do that? And in order for you to be able to do that, because what I think is people may feel and have heard something and they want to reduce, but if they are not aware of the framework of managing their pain, then they will either at the first sign of failure or not doing well, will get more worried and will not want to do it again. So I think it's, it's a delicate balance in the run up to actually saying, okay, now I've held your hand, let's now start this slow process, which Dee describes over two to four weeks, but that discussion beforehand has to be had and what dosage they are on. So I think it is a slightly more complicated upstream thinking that has to be done before we come to the process there. And that's where I think a lot of help will need more training to help patients who are thinking about wanting to reduce or are ready to reduce. Thank you, Deepak. Um, we have had a question, um, somebody's asking how long it takes the, your body and brain to adjust to um, not having, say, an opioid in your system after you've tapered to zero. I mean, does your body adjust very quickly or does it take some time? You'd like to ask that. Shall I go for it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. As far as the, med so there are two things here. One is being looked after by the body, the liver, and those organs. In that sense, the medicine will come out of the system in a few days time at the most, and it shouldn't last, the actual drug effect shouldn't last there for more than three, four days. The way I describe it is that if patients have been on a certain amount of medicine, opioids for a certain time, it's almost as if the body's internal factories have decided that it's importing stuff from outside. So it does, the way to think about it is we got all from overseas and realistically, we didn't really have to do any production of PPEs and gloves in the UK because it was all coming from the outside and, and we were happy and you know things are fine. But then when you suddenly stopped everything, all exports were stopped, nothing was coming into the UK about PP, we still had to scramble. That scrambling period is the withdrawal phenomenon that people experience there before the body's internal factories kind of catch up and start making our own endorphins to look after our systems. A few days time to come, kits will adjust itself and rewire itself in a few days and things will settle down. So that period of the drugs and adjustments is usually up to a week. I think Emma will clarify whether that can take longer in some people or not, but that's what I generally tell patients in the clinic is a few days as the actual drug dosage. There is a different part there as in how the nerve circuits in the brain and in the spinal cord, they change once the fuel of the external opioids reduce. That takes a little and if there is more and resilience and other things to do in terms of providing for that, that process is quicker. However, it can take a little longer in other people where you don't have those processes in place. And that is really a piece of string. I don't have any evidence or data to say in clear days or numbers but that would be my best suggestion. Brilliant, thank you. Emma, do you want to talk or do you? Uh, I'd be interested to, to hear Emma's thoughts on this. So Deepak, I would um, agree with those sort of first few days in terms of the, um, 
the the kidneys, the liver, and so on. I just love your analogy about PPE. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, but um, my experience is when you think of the opioids in particular, people can often be troubled by quite nasty headaches for six weeks. Um, and they, what I often see is that the withdrawal effects or the side effects of withdrawing will gradually, gradually, gradually reduce. And then there'll be a little blip and gradually reduce and a little blip. And the time between blips elongates. But I, I have had a number of people where it's taken six months to settle entirely. And there is a bit of evidence in the addiction literature that would support that. Um, and uh, again, I've seen similar with the gabapentinoids, perhaps not as long as, as six months, but you know, quite some time. And also with the drugs we use from the antidepressant. I rather suspect that this goes back to the comment I made about blood tests and genetics. And actually there's something about our, our individual internal makeup and our sensitivity to drugs and drug side effects that um, long after I've retired will um, be guiding practitioners. Emma, I don't know if you've got further things to say about that. Probably, uh, sorry, <laughs> Emma, can I just, one, one clarification on there. Dee, I think you're right about that part there. So as I said, um, my reading around the same part of the literature was that it would it may not be down to the the drug itself hanging about for that long. Not the I mean uh, I don't know which metabolite would hang for that long. Either the circuits would be changed. You know the way in the brain work they would be changed. Those changes don't go away that quickly. Now whether those changes, as you said, um, what you call the the genetics part of it a little bit change is there. We now know that um, genes kind of uh, load the gun, but the pulling of the trigger is due to what's available in the environment, whether that's resilience, whether that's food, whether that's nutrition, all of those. So I would say probably that in those people that blips, I think you have more experience because looking after these patients for that length of time, I wouldn't see them but I think the blips are more likely to be to, due to those kind of epigenetic changes that are there and the nerve circuits that are still hanging on to old thoughts and going back to those firing circuits, those pathways that still don't get changed very efficiently. So I guess just a little bit of addition on there, but that's really good. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Uh, well, Deepak stole my thunder there. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, th I think they, those things are, are, are pretty much covered. But yeah, so we, we know, well, we can sort of predict how long it will take um, somebody to clear a drug. So we have what we call pharmacokinetic data, which is how a drug affects um, bodily systems and or how the bodily systems affect the drug um, but certainly um, perhaps not so much opioids which are, tend to be cleared quite quickly and where the withdrawal effects tend for the majority of people to settle reasonably quickly but there can be some effects such as constipation for example which can take several weeks to reverse once you've stopped opioids. So, you know, so we would always say for somebody to continue laxatives, for example, if they had constipation on opioids, even after, for a while after they've stopped taking the opioid, because um, different parts of the body will take different amounts of time to restore. And as um, both Dee and Deepak have said, it will also depend on other factors. So other conditions that you have, other medicines that you take, um, 
what we are learning a lot more about are some of the other medicines, so like gabapentinoids, antidepressant type medicines. And I was smiling, not because I think this is funny, but because Lou and I have been in a meeting all day discussing this very thing. <laughs> it's been quite traumatic. Um, so some of those um, withdrawal effects, people will still report actually four years. So some of the sort of more, um, what might be termed psychiatric or psychological side effects uh, with antidepressants, people might have heard about these things called brain zaps. So where people get a sudden, sudden sort of firing, a very odd um, unsettling sensation. And people will report those for several years after stopping um, antidepressants. And we're starting to see similar things coming through around gabapentinoids, um, pregabalin in particular. And I think as Deepak said, there must be, because we have no other good explanation, but so there must be some epigenetic factors which contribute to that. And that would explain why some people find that to be a long-term problem and other people sail through withdrawal with very few problems and feel quite cleared of the drug quite soon after stopping it. A, a lot of answers in pain management are hugely unsatisfactory and gray <laughs> when what we all want is a nice black and white response. And I, I'm, I, I'm just gonna say, apologize to everybody listening. <laughs> if you think, well, that hasn't really settled anything in my head. It's just maybe I've you know, got more questions, but that, that's unfortunately pain management, I think, that we have as much uncertainty as we do answers. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, that's certainly true. I mean, I, I got off huge doses of gabapentin with nary a withdrawal, whereas fentanyl is a completely different experience for me. So it, you can have huge individual differences just in the person. Uh, Louise, did you want to round up with anything on that? Yeah, just uh, just exactly what you said there, Nikki. I think it depends on you. It depends on the drug. Um, you know, I think, and again, it's a similar story. What you were saying with the antidepressants have been the thing for me. Um, I was lucky. I had a rapid taper off opioids. I say lucky. I do think it it was lucky. Um, but whereas it took me about two years to to taper one of the antidepressants. So it it really does depend. Um, so we're all different, and I think. Um, we're hoping that this is going to be um, one of many discussions we're going to have um, in the coming months at the festival to do with, with medication. So watch this space and we're, we're hoping to bring you a lot more. So, yeah, uh, that, that's really it, Nikki, I think. <laughs> I think we're, we're about at the right time to wind this up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just managed to choke myself just at the wrong point. Um, yeah, I think, uh, does anybody want to sort of have any quick sort of roundup comments before we leave? All good, wave if you do. No, if what, we've, I just... We've got a hand up, I think, Nikki. We've got, um, Chris has got a hand up. I can't, can't see that. If it's you, it's just applause, it's applause. That's it. Oh. <laughs> There you go. See, it's, it's applause for everybody's wonderful. And, and I agree completely. And I want to thank you all so much for today. You've all been awesome. And this, I hope, has been a very valuable um, event. It certainly has been for me personally. And um, I'm so grateful that you came here. And um, just apologies again for our huge technical. It wasn't our fault. Yes. No idea what happened. I'm really sorry. And thank you for your patience, everybody. So. Nikki, can um, I just say thank you as well to Francis Cole, um, yes. my friend and colleague who's been diligently answering questions as well as we've gone through. So thanks very much, Francis, because I don't think the rest mm -hmm. of us have stepped up, to be honest. No, Francis, no. as always, doing an awesome job in the background. She's just brilliant. And, um, hi, Francis. <laughs> hi, Francis. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. But thank you all for coming and uh, being with us today and um, hopefully we'll have the recording of this on the website soon so you can check out anything that you might have missed and yes it would be lovely to do it again sometime so with that thank you ever so much people thank you